Good morning, and, and please be seated. As I shared with you over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the issue of elders and what that might look like in a, in a church, especially as we investigate the New Testament and how they, uh, their role was there at the beginning of the church as well as its implications for our church today. So this morning I want to move to the topic of male leadership and the important uh, aspect of the, uh, uh, of the role of a, uh, an elder in the church and what role males and females play in this sort of leadership. I turn to your attention to a passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 3. Chapter 11, beginning with verse 3. But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head. And every woman who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is the one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her head cut off from cut off or her head shaved, let her head be covered. A man should not cover his head because he is in the image and the glory of God. So too women is, a, is in the glory of man. The man did not come from woman, but the woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but the woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In the Lord, however... Woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman comes from man, so man comes through woman, and all things come from God. Now, that's quite a challenging passage, isn't it? Those are ones we'd rather gloss over than to deal with. Now, in, a, in today's egalitarian culture, it's inconceivable that organizations would even, even consider excluding women from various aspects of its leadership structure, and barbaric if they would actually do so. So when a church limits roles to males, like elders, pastor, teachers, the culture, and even some in the church would cry discrimination, sexism, misogyny, and point to such actions as another case of male dominance and female suppression. Let me tell you, anyone, anyone who knows about or has experienced the love of God and with integrity stand on the words of God and truly love people and who are painfully aware of how women have been oppressed, suppressed, mistreated, and sadly abused, and other things they have suffered and endured at the hands of abusive men, why would they want to do anything that would give the appearance of hurting women is beyond my comprehension. God is loving, God is good. His people should be the same. God did not create us for competition, but to complement one another. He created us male and female to cooperate in God's given privilege and command to procreate. But God also created us male and female that goes beyond our role of sexual union. It extends to our roles and responsibility in all matters of life. We will look this morning at God's word to discover his plan for men and women in spiritual leadership. So I hope you stay tuned. I am confident that God wants to speak to us and to lead us in this matter of giving our church the leadership that is ordained from him. So let us... Father, we come today to acknowledge your holiness, your perfection, your glory, 
your greatness. There is no God like you. And you know the challenges we are facing as we gather here individually, collectively, all that's going on in our lives. And we're so thankful that you're still on the throne. And we want to honor you with our lives. Even though we don't understand all the things that are going on, we are confident that you're in control. And you're going to guide us and lead us. And you're going to accomplish in and through us something that we could not do on our own. So that we'd stand back and give you the glory. Lord, I thank you for the trials. I thank you for the testing. I thank you for the uncertainty in this life but the confidence as we walk each and every day with you that you are at work bringing about your purpose. So we're trusting you. I ask now that you would speak to us as only you can. Guide our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I know for our congregation the idea of having a plurality of elders leading our congregation is quite challenging and I've had some people tell me Let's, why don't you just do it pastor <laughs> and I don't think that's the best approach to making any change in a congregation there was uh, one winter day when friends of, of mine and, and myself we went to this place and we started doing some four wheeling I had a wonderful 78 Dodge pickup and man, I love that pickup the black and yellow one I don't know if you remember it and it said Dodge Power Wagon on the back I just got a job and I sunk all my mom's money into it to buy it <laughs> and I had to pay her back but that day it turned to evening and while we were there it turned real snowy and as you left the parking lot of where we were uh, having our enjoyment where it was a hill you had to go straight up and by that time there was about six inches of snow on the ground and no plows and so one of the vehicles had gone off to the side so I uh, got out of my truck and I could just show them how this Dodge Power Wagon works and got out my chain and I hooked it up to the back of my truck and I told the guy who was with the girl whose car it was to hook it up to her car and we'll pull that thing up the hill and get it out of there. So we got it ready to go. He hooked it all up and I gave it a little gas and nothing. I couldn't get it going. So I thought I'd give it a jerk. And I gave it a jerk and guess what I jerked? The radiator right out of the car. He had hooked the chain up to the radiator. And when I jerked it, it made a mess. So I'm going to tell you today, I'm not going to jerk the church around. And I'm not going to jerk you along. But I'm going to have you attach these truths to the solid word of God. And we'll make this up this hill. And we'll be better for it as a result. So let me uh, draw your attention to some things this morning that I have outlined in your bulletin that I hope will help. Number one, as we understand male leadership concerning authority, spiritual leadership, number one, I want you to see Jesus and the creation. Now the first thing about Jesus and the creation is the first thing I want you to see, that he is the originator of all things. You and I as Christians, this becomes obvious to us as we read scripture. We see in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. John chapter 1 verse 3 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he was with God in the beginning and all things were created through him and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created and then we know later on in that same chapter we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we understand that as Jesus he is the one who was in the beginning, he is the word, and through him all things were brought into existence. So he is the originator of all things. Number two, he is also, as the originator, he is also the organizer of creation. So it has order. 
Creation has order. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, I do not have those on the screen for you, but you will find them in your Bible, at least your copy of the Bible. Uh, it's too much to read right now, but for the sake of time, let me show you some things concerning the creation. When God created, he created light. And then he created the water and he separated the water and then he separated the water from the dry land. So you see a progression. There's light, there's water, there's dry land and then he creates vegetation. And then he creates animals. We have sea animals and that day there's also birds that fly in the air. And then he creates land animal, animals. And all those are, are in, in need of what the light produces, what the water provides, and what the earth and dry land also provides. And so the vegetation was in need of those things. And then they had, it had origin, it had organization, and it had purpose. And then God created a, a, a light, a lesser light, and a, and, a, and, a, and a greater light that would also govern the seasons, which would be part of the vegetation. And then he created humans, male and female. God has an order for everything. He has ordered everything. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses, verse 33, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So we're talking about the need for things to be done in order just as God created all things. And so the very next verse in chapter 14 is one of those critical verses we have a difficult time understanding. It says the women should be silent in the churches for are not permitted to speak and are not but are to submit themselves, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband at home, since it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Does that mean women just do not speak in church? No, he's addressing a very important issue that's happening in the church at Corinth. There was teaching going on. There was a proclamation of God's word. There was prophecy going on. And what was happening? Confusion ensued. The women were a big part of the confusion because they disregard God or God's order to keep things orderly. And as a result, he wanted them to be quiet and to learn from their husbands because he had a purpose in this. To keep things orderly. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that same chapter in verse 40, it says, but everything is to be done decently and in order. One thing I will tell you about the church at Corinth, it did not understand how to do things decently and orderly as God ordained, as we see clearly as he did in the creation. So when a man, according to scripture, and a woman have a relationship, it's called marriage. And it's the foundation for the home. Also the foundation for the church home. and even culture itself, that things should be done in God's ordained order and in peace. Number three, let's understand what this order, the reason for which it's established and already partially addressed there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Number three, that Jesus is also the ordainer of spiritual authority. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 23, then the Lord God made the rib. Now remember, at this time, Adam was by himself. God caused the sleep to come over Adam. He reached into Adam's side and he pulled out a rib and he fashioned a woman. And he made her and brought her to the man. And the man said, ah, this one at last. None of the animals satisfied him. None of the animals were like him. None of the animals could be that support that he needed. And he brought the woman to the man and he said, ha, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman. For she was taken 
from man. Notice the order. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8, for the man did not come from woman. The woman came from the man. Neither was the man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man. And man is not independent of woman. So you can see the cooperation there. Yet you also see the order of authority there too. For just as woman came from man, so man came through woman. And all things come from God. A very unique order and, and roles, yet the cooperation is there, but not superiority. God never said that man was better than woman. God never said light was better than water. God never said the water and the light are better than the land. But each had a very important role and responsibility. And you and I will do well as Christians to understand the roles and responsibilities God has given us as men and women. Let's set the record straight. Divine order does not mean distinction of superiority and inferiority. But it does mean the difference and distinction concerning roles and responsibilities. God intended men to bear a very unique responsibility, not sole responsibility, but unique, a special responsibility for spiritual leadership in relationship to women concerning the authority of God's word. And let me prove it. In Genesis chapter three, if you want to understand the very foundational teachings of God's word, you want to understand the foundation of doctrine, just go to Genesis. There, there's a great ministry, says answers in Genesis, because it all begins right there. You don't understand the book of Genesis, you're going to miss the understanding of the rest of the Bible. The foundation is there. In Genesis chapter 3, if you and I lose or fail to maintain the order, chaos will ensue. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, now the serpent, after these two were, were created, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat, the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. I want you to see when Satan came at that moment, he came when both of them were present. Look at verse six. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And then she also gave some to her husband, who was what? With her and ate it. You know what those two did that very day? They forgot God's order of authority concerning the authority of his word. Adam and Eve ignored that order. And Paul says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. What does that mean? There is a sense in which Adam was deceived. He did eat. In fact, when Paul treats the fall of man in Romans chapter 5, he lays the guilt entirely on Adam. Never mentioning Eve as the guilty party here. Why? Why? Because they ignored God's order concerning the authority of his word. Adam should have stood up and when Satan confronted the couple, he should have assumed his authority concerning God's word and say, this is what God's word says. That we are not to eat of the tree at the center of the garden. The tree of evil the knowledge of evil and good. Because if we do, we will die. Not touch it, but if we eat it, we will die. But 
Adam failed in his responsibility to take that authority upon himself as God had given him and relinquish it to his wife, and as a result, chaos ensued. Satan did not, not, attack, did not attack the work they did caring for the animals or the land. Of course they worked together to accomplish these things. I can picture Eve having a role of providing leadership and making sure things were done well to care for all the llama and the, and the platypus and all the other things that were around them. I've seen the same thing happen in my own home and I imagine many of us have seen it happen in their own home. I relied heavily on Heather's leadership in our home. When it came to the matter of finances, caring for our children, and caring for the house. She often directed me to do something with my children. She pointed me to the full trash can, and to the vacuum, and to the duster, and to the basket of clothes that needed to be carried upstairs and hung in the closet. Was Heather demonstrating authority over me? Of course not. She was providing leadership in the home. But when it came to the word of God, my wife turned to me. When she needed things from the grocery store, she wrote me a list and said, don't come home without them. <laughs> was she usurping my God-giving authority? Absolutely not. She was providing leadership in the home. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God expects women to provide leadership in the church. Amen. Under the authority of the men who are to know God's word and how to apply it to the life of every individual, every family, and the entire church. When it came to God's word, Heather submitted to my God-given authority. My responsibility to teach and to lead my family to know, understand, and obey God's word as a family. So when Satan attacked, he attacked the order of authority concerning God's word and its teaching or its doctrine. And fallen man continues to try to change that order, that spiritual authority. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, and yet he will rule over you. He will have spiritual authority over your life. Number two, that's creation. I want you to see Jesus and the culture. Number one, Jesus coming as a son, a male, and there's a reason for that. When Jesus, who created all things in order and giving it proper spiritual authority and creating humans, came into this world as a son. He came as a son, not a daughter, the firstborn male, holy unto the Lord, as Luke chapter 2, verse 23 says, for it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. He had, uh, Alexander Strzok wrote this in his book concerning uh, elder leadership. And it might not be up here. We got it? Yeah. Oh, he got his picture too. Cool. He had to be the firstborn son of David and Abraham, the true son of promise, the king, not the queen of Israel and the Lord, not the lady of the universe. According to the creation order, Jesus could not be a woman because of the male-female relationship. The male partner alone is invested with the headship authority role, as these scriptures remind us. And Jesus Christ alone is the head of the church and the king of kings. He is the model for every man to provide the uh, spiritual leadership each and every home needs and the church. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, who is Jesus. Verse 47 tells us the first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Romans chapter 5, verse 14, Paul puts it this way, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is the type of the coming one. He came to fulfill. Jesus came to restore and to order the things of God as he came as a man. He was recognized one who has taught with authority. He said, you heard it said, but I tell you. He taught the word of God with authority. Number two, Jesus' choice of apostles. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, I won't read it for you, but I will tell you what it says, and you can read it for yourself. Jesus, when it came to establish the foundation of his church, he spent all night in prayer, seeking his father's wisdom and guidance when he selected those who would be the foundation of the church. And guess what he came out with? He came out with 12 men. His choice was a divine principle and guidance, not to accommodate a male dominant, feel a female oppressive culture. If he really wanted to abolish distinct roles of authority of men and women, at a crucial time when he was selecting the foundation of the church, he could have at least selected one woman to be an apostle. Better yet, he should have selected six and six. Someone says he did that only because he was trying to appease his male dominant culture. Really? Jesus was one to uh, appease the culture? Number three, Jesus critics. In John chapter 1, verse 10 through 11, he was in the world, and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Why? He was turning his culture upside down. He was counterculture. Let me give you a few examples here. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. When the Pharisees approached Jesus and said, Your disciples, they're not washing their hands before they eat, maintaining the tr traditions. And he answered them, Why do you break God's command? Because of your traditions. Rather than honoring your parents like the scripture teaches you, you take those resources that you have and you claim they're for God's work rather than taking care of your parents only because you want to keep them for yourself. In Matthew chapter 19 verses 23 to 26, Jesus said, I tell you, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easy for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then the disciples say, are you kidding me? If rich people can't get into heaven, we understand that rich people are the ones who are blessed by God, so obviously they have a skate right into heaven. He says, you don't understand. What's impossible with men it's not impossible with God. In a verse 12 and 13 of chapter 21, Jesus went into the temple. And as they were doing traditionally, they were taking the advantage of all of those who were coming to worship in order to buy their sacrifices. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. Your culture has changed the purpose for which God's house exists. He was accommodating his culture when he selected his apostles. Shame on us. What part of Jesus was overly concerned with the culture? He was at his time subject to it, Yet at other times he challenged it. When he did challenge these things, it led to his crucifixion. Why? Because his culture that should have embraced him 
had abused and strayed so far from God's order, they didn't know the one who created that order. Number three, Jesus and his church. There was a continuity of male leadership. When the need came to replace Judas, the one who hanged himself after after what he did to Jesus, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, therefore, where they were all together, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time, Jesus went in and out among us. Where do they choose the next leaders in the church? From the men who accompanied them. And then the 12, when the church was growing and it was in almost uh, impossible for them to continue to stay in the word and prayer, they needed someone to serve the tables. And it tells us in Acts chapter 6, in those days as the disciples were increasing in number, what did they do? They chose those who would serve in this capacity, and they chose men. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parnius, Nicholas. And the apostles selected men. And when it comes to a church selecting spiritual leaders, it's elders, overseers, pastor teachers. Here's what the scripture says. And we're going to look at more of this next week, the qualifications. This saying is true in 1 Timothy. If anyone aspires to be overseer, elder, pastor teacher, it's a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first, and they, if they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too must be worthy of respect, not slander, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own household, households competently. Do you see the consistency of male leadership when it concerns the authority of God's word? Number two, we need to avoid corrupting, corrupting order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, again, the passage I read at first, a man should not cover his head because he is the image of the glory of God. So woman is the glory of man. Man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. I think that's about as clear as you can get on God's order. In Ephesians chapter 5, we can see that order lived out in verses 22 and following. Wives... Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. And how does he make her holy? The washing of water by the word. The authority of God's word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor. Man, if you want to bring glory to yourself, you want to honor your wife, you want to make her beautiful, you want to make her spectacular and wonderful, teach her the word of God. 
understand the word of God and impart it to her that she too might be glorified in a sense. Be radiant. Be beautiful. And everything God intended her to be. The church at Corinth was corrupted with spiritual authority and order. When it came to its leaders, they were corrupt. When it came to the practice of the Lord's Supper, they were corrupt. When it came to exercising the manifestation gifts, they were corrupt and out of order. And dealing with doctrine and teaching matters, they were corrupt and out of order. Last week we learned that the primary role of an elder is to preach and teach and nourish and feed the flock. This is divinely reserved for men to lead in humble authority done properly as God ordained and God has ordered. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 26, let me show you the confusion that was happening in the church so you can understand how to interpret this passage. Women will provide great leadership in the church and they'll lead in all sorts of areas. I see nothing in scripture that teaches that a woman cannot lead a congregation in worship. I see nothing in scripture that says a woman cannot lead a congregation in caring for its children. I see nothing in scriptures that women cannot lead in organizing various structures of the church in order to accomplish what the church was set out to do. God has gifted women in such ways. But when it comes to the authority of God's word, men have been given the responsibility to give the church, the family, the marriage, the culture itself, that guidance. And when they don't, you don't become a church that is recognized for setting a good example, but a bad one. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see this fleshed out. Then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, one has a hymn, teaching, a revelation, another tongue, an interpretation. Everything is to be done. If anyone speaks in another language, there is to be only two. It seems like there were many more than that. Could you imagine a confusion of all these different languages being spoken at once? Or at the most three, each in turn. And let someone interpret. But if there is no interpreter, that person is to keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should evaluate. Let me tell you what's happening in the church here. The word of God, the doctrine is being proclaimed. The church is being taught. And then there's also a debate about what's being taught, making sure that this argument that's being put forth is actually the true unadulterated word of God. Standing firm on God's principles. And what was happening? The women were popping up too. And they were shouting out and carrying on. And there was nothing but chaos and disorders, and disorder happening in the church. And so Paul says, listen, women should be silent. Not in every matter of the church. But when it comes to the things of God, the authority of his word, men should learn from their husbands. And the men in the church should be given the church the leadership that it needs to understand and to know God's word and how to apply it to their lives and to continue to stand on it every day of their lives. Paul said this to Timothy, a woman is to learn quietly in full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over man. Doesn't mean she's not gonna have times where she gives administrative guidance and direction. But the only authority we have is God's word. And no woman should have that authority over her husband. A man should stand up and take his full responsibility. And the same in the church. Man, we have a huge responsibility to this congregation, let alone our own family, to make sure we're standing on the truth of God's word. That we know it and we apply it and we proclaim it. A woman is this learn quietly in full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over man. Instead, she was remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. I didn't write this stuff. I've just learned that if I do it the way God says, things work a lot better. 
And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was de deceived in the transgression. Why is this all important? This is why it's important. Number three, to maintain the conduit of salvation. You and I have been given the responsibility to take the good news of Jesus Christ and to make sure that we're doing it as a conduit that is clean and that God can work through. If a man or a church, I think, cleanses himself of these things. He is the vessel unto honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. A congregation needs to be prepared by being obedient to God's order and plan so that we can be the conduit through which he uses in order to bring salvation throughout this world. God wants to use a church like that. For we are saved by grace through faith. And faith comes by what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message of Christ. And when it comes to salvation, every boy, girl, man, and woman has the privilege of coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the faith that God provides for everyone, regardless of your sex, regardless of your nationality, regardless of what you've done. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek Slave or free, male or female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Do you see the importance of doing it God's way? God's word is clear how we should order ourselves as a congregation. And to make sure that we are living up to our roles and responsibilities as male and female as leaders and followers, as spiritual Christians and those who are learning to grow in the Lord. My, what will happen when we do it God's way? What a difference he is going to make. Let me remind you again as we come to this table this morning we come to commemorate, celebrate what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. That he died. That it was his body that was given for us. It was his blood that was shed. It was he who took upon himself our sin. We've messed up his design with our sin. And through the grace of God, he has restored it. And we've trusted him by faith. And we learn as he teaches us. And we then have the opportunity to be restored to the order that he intended. It's all because of what he did. And this morning is a reminder as we come to this table that in obedience, we do this. In obedience, we remember it was him who made our salvation possible. And it's an obedience, a reminder that we're not alone. We're in the work together. And to provide the role and responsibility, to do that role and responsibility God has given us. So Father, I first ask that you would do a work in each man's heart here today that he will see that this God-ordained authority that you have given us to provide the spiritual leader in our home, in our church, in our community, that this is not something that we should be arrogant about or think of being superior, but a recognition of this humble responsibility to be the leaders you've called us to be. Father, forgive us where we have 
relinquish that control, where we have been derelicts concerning it. Restore us, Father, to what you intended us to be, the men of God you've called us to be. I lift each woman up to you, and I thank you for each one. I thank you for their giftedness. I thank you for their ability to, to give leadership and to, and to serve in many aspects. I ask that they will find fulfillment in the role in which you have placed them, and that together we will be those useful vessels and accomplishing what you've called us to do and to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we'll stand on those truths and be clear in the proclamation. I thank you for this supper again that reminds us of the one who submitted to you, the one who died in our stead, and the one who was raised again to give us life. May we not come carelessly to this table, but with respect and honor and confidence in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.